Good morning, citizens of the world, to those people tuning in from across America, and a good afternoon to those of you tuning in with me from South Africa and across the world. Now, we have a special town hall meeting today, and we're joined by a very special panel. Um, and this has been possible because of the partnership between Advertising Week, the Mandela Institution of Humanity, as well as the National Urban League. Now, we are joined by our Honorable Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, Mayor of Atlanta. Unfortunately, she has a tight schedule and not be able to uh, continue with us for much longer. So we will focus on Mayor. Mayor, thank you for making the time to join us this morning. Thank you for having me. It is such an honor uh, to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, now, I can imagine the, 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 the atmosphere in America must be so tense uh, and, 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 and electrifying. I mean, can you just give us you know, the, a picture of what's happening and what you're having to deal with in America right now, those of us who are not in America? There is such a range of emotions because I think what's very clear to all of us is that we are, a, we are in the midst of a transformational movement in this country. And I think that it's important not to lose sight of what this movement is all about. We witnessed this horrific murder of George Floyd and we saw the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey, and, and we've been talking about the murder of Breonna Taylor and so many other names that can be called. But it, in my lifetime, at least, I've not seen anything like this in America. Uh, we know the rich legacy of the civil rights movement, but I think it's so very clear to so many people there is this, this collective range of emotions that we are experiencing from grief to anger to frustration to really um, just a push for change in this country, and we see it happening already. That is... Um... It's, it's, it's definitely a tough time. And now, you know, Black people have, you know, been fighting for their rights since the days of Marcus Garvey, Steve Beacon, South Africa. And, and we are here at another juncture in history where we're seeing that we have to continuously fight for our rights. Um, what do you have to say for generally progression of Black people and how, you know, this has, it has actually you know, perpetrate to the, the globe and you've seen movements across different countries around the world. So, you know, this is, um again, it's interesting looking at this through various lenses. One lens I'm looking at it through is through the lens of my mother who was a college student during the civil rights movement. And what she said to me recently was, this America doesn't feel like 1965. It feels like something before 1965. This was before we started seeing the demonstrations. And I think that really, uh, that spoke to the state of our country, that for all of the steps we've taken forward, for so many people, it's, it's, it feels like we've taken so many steps back. Um, but what I would say is, and I, I quote Audre Lord a lot, revolution is not a one-time event. And we know that whether it's a civil rights movement in America or, or the push to end apartheid in South Africa, that it was a series of events and a series of organized and intentional acts that made change lasting. And I think that this moment in time, what we're seeing with the demonstrations on our streets, this is a part of that series of acts, but I think that it's taken us so much closer because even as we had elections in the state of Georgia yesterday for as unorganized and frustrating as it was, what was not lost on me was that people were showing up to vote and they were willing to stand in line for six to eight hours to exercise their right to vote. And I think that's what we will see going into November because we know that leadership matters and it's gonna be important that we restore moral leadership um, in the highest office in America. That is very true. Now, Mayor, I see that there was some controversy about you know, the votes 
and whether the vote counts and the way the system is designed in America is that not all the votes count. Um, could you please clarify this for us? Yeah, so there, uh, voter suppression comes in all forms. Sometimes it is in making it difficult for people to vote. At other times, it's removing people's names from the voter rolls. I had a conversation with my cousin yesterday who has voted for over 30 years. He showed up to vote, and they said his name had been removed because he was a convicted felon, which was not true. And then I think it also comes in the form of, of propaganda, going into our social media feeds, telling people you shouldn't vote or that you should essentially look for perfection or stay home. And so I think that's why it's going to be incumbent upon us um, as Americans to show up in record numbers to vote because we know that there are going to be efforts not to count votes or to make it difficult for people to vote. But that means that we've got to continue to register to vote and we've got to show up to vote so there is no room for error um, in the way that we saw happen in our last presidential election in 2016. Hundred percent. I mean, we all know that you know black people and people of African origin have always fought for democracy, as it's one of the ways in which we can truly choose the leaders that represent us and represent our interests. Now we have seen the current president of America uh, at points. You know, he 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 he's never really on a straight and narrow. You know, he 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 likes to bob and weave left to the right. Um, <laughs> And this is a critical time when we need serious leadership. Now, I can see not only in America, but across the world, there's been a vacuum, a huge vacuum created for, for leadership. Uh, who are the people that you would say are actually uh, leading people correctly and, 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 and telling them what is important? So the beauty of our democracy in America is no matter how many times we get it wrong, there is another opportunity to get it right. And that's the opportunity that people have in America in November of 2020. They have an opportunity to go back and to get it right by electing moral leadership. Right now, a very strong voice that, that I um, so admire and respect is that of Vice President Joe Biden. He has spoken the words and offer the healing and, and the acknowledgement of the hurt and pain that we could only hope that we would get from, from our president. But what I know is that we have a finite amount of energy and time. And for every minute we give to the president who has a complete inability to give us any more than what he's already given us is one minute less that we have to give towards really making change in this country and speaking to people of good conscience, no matter their party affiliation, who say that they recognize that there's a problem in this country and we need to work together to fix it. So in November, we have an opportunity to get it right. But until November, we've got to continue to mobilize and articulate what it is that we see wrong with our country and offer real solutions as to how we see we can get it right. And we know that change can happen. We've seen it happen in America. We witnessed it. We witnessed um, how it happened in South Africa. And, and I, I know that it's still possible and we'll see it happen in November of 2020. Uh, Mayor, lastly, uh, before you leave us, um, you know, we've seen some protests, marches growing in other countries. What can the people of the world do to continue supporting and be in solidarity with the people who are fighting for justice in America? I think what you just said, just seeing the protest and the gathering of people and acknowledgement of the hurt and pain that we are experiencing in America is, is so heartwarming to me. Because it, what it says to me is that the names of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so many other names, that these people did not die in vain. And it was not how anybody um, with anybody of, of good conscience would choose to have seen their lives in in such a, a tragic way. But I, I would hope that it is of comfort to their family to know 
that people around the globe are acknowledging that there's real hurt and pain and there is a need for change, not just in America, but in countries all across this globe. And the only way that we can make it sustaining and lasting, if really it is a global effort and a global awakening, and that's what I see happening. And I just, I just ask and encourage people to continue pushing forward and to do it in the spirit of Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King Jr. and so many others um, who believe that there could be a better day for their children and their children's children. And we've got to believe that for ours as well. Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. And please continue doing the wonderful work that you're doing to lead our people, to inspire our people, to continue marching in the face of adversity. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone to a town hall for change. And we are hosted today by the Mandela Institute for Humanity and the National Urban League. Today on our panel, we will have Indaba Mandela, the founder and chairman of the Mandela Institute for Humanity. We have Mark Morial, CEO of the National Urban League. Jeff Clanigan, president of Kevin Hart's Laugh Out Loud and CEO of Code Black Films. We have Tip T.I. Harris, rapper, actor, and entrepreneur. We have Jayanta Jenkins, who is the co-founder of Saturday Morning. And I'm Monique Nelson, your host and moderator for today, and the chair and CEO of UWG, the longest standing multicultural marketing and advertising agency in the US. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us today. It's such an honor to be here with my brothers and host you in this wonderful forum and a forum that is necessary for us to further our cause in civil rights. So I kind of want to start with the fact that we need to look forward. We need to figure out how we change what we know is wrong. But something feels really different in this moment. It feels global. It's unprecedented in terms of the support that we're seeing during this time. We've had COVID, we've had our fallen brothers and sisters, and the protests continue around the world. I'd love to start today with each of you giving a couple of minutes around an opening statement. What are you thinking about in this moment? This group has been meticulously picked and we want to make sure that we hear your points of view. And I'd love to start with Ndabu. Please give us your opening. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining in today. Um, you know, what, I, what comes to mind and what I think about is that, you know, the ugly face of racism, of prejudice, of injustice never takes a break. It is on us every day. You go out, you have to deal with it. There is not a single day when you go into the world and racism decides, oh, today I'm going to be nice. So in keeping that in mind, it is important that we do not grow tired. We need to continue marching, protesting, and making our voices heard and making our presence felt until we see proper justice, the policy changes, and all the rules of engagement as far as police is concerned need to be adhered to. We cannot rest, we cannot stop. We have to be bolder, we have to be more courageous to continue this fight until justice is met. Thank you, thank you. Mark, I'd love to talk to you. As a son of a first black mayor of New Orleans, the wonderful CEO of the Urban League, You've been built as a change agent around youth, empowerment, entrepreneurship. What are your opening thoughts? Well, first of all, I wanna thank you, Monique, and I wanna thank Advertising Week and uh, thank the Mandela Foundation and, and DABA and all of the guests who joined for this conversation today for being part of an important conversation at a very crucial and important time uh, in, uh, in American history and world history, but also 
uh, in our own lives. I think we are at, we're on the cusp uh, of a new movement, a movement against racism, a movement against hate, a movement that uh, finally this nation may be prepared to confront this legacy of slavery and segregation and institutional racism. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to do two things. Uh, one, appear before the House Judiciary Committee uh, in testimony uh, on behalf of the new Justice and Policing Act, which was introduced on Monday by Representative Karen Bass, uh, Senator Cory Booker, Senator Kamala Harris, and about 200 other members of Congress. Uh, and, and that bill is designed to go right at the heart uh, of the injustice in policing that we've seen. It would ban chokeholds. It would ban no-knock warrants. It would create a new framework for both civil and criminal uh, uh, reforms when it comes to holding police officers accountable. It would require a national accreditation system for police departments. It's a comprehensive bill. It's a great and powerful bill. And it was just an honor to be able to testify along with a number of others, including George Floyd's brother, who along with Ben Crump appeared before the committee uh, on yesterday. It was a powerful hearing. And this bill represents the kind of immediate policy change we need to address, begin, I'll say begin to address the challenges with policing. Secondly, I had a chance afterwards uh, to go down to Black Lives Matter Plaza here in Washington, D.C., uh, along with a, a civil rights colleague of mine, Janet McGee, who leads Unidos US, which is the largest like, Latino civil rights organization in the country. Uh, we went down, decided to go walk down uh, to the plaza, walk down to where the protest was taking place, to be a part of the protest and to be in solidarity with the protesters. And of course, the protest is so powerful because of who you see and, and the atmosphere. It's an atmosphere of hope. It's an atmosphere of positive change. It's an atmosphere of determination. It's people, uh, black people and white people and young people and old people and Latinx and Asian American. And, uh, there were teenagers down there and there was a drum corps down there. Uh, and, 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 and just the sense of purpose that people are bringing to this moment uh, all across the land and all across the world. My own two teenage children uh, one, my 14-year-old, asked me to take her to a protest on Saturday, which I did. Uh, my son, who's 18, and he and his friends are organizing a teenage, organizing a teenage-led led protest. Uh, the, this is profound. It's, it's moving. It's, it's, it's significant because this is happening, you know, organically. This is happening, uh, you know, by people on their own motion uh, in response to the, the killing and I call it the lynching of George Floyd on the streets of Minneapolis. Uh, so I, I'm taken by the moment and, and want to make sure that uh, we are all in this movement. We all have to be in this movement in our own way. Uh, you protest online, uh, contributing, uh, however we can. This is a movement that, that, that can change this nation, that has to change this nation, and this nation needs this moment of transformation. So I sense it and I feel it. What do I worry about that it is a moment and not a movement? It's got to be a movement right. and not just a Absolutely. moment. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. Would love to turn to you, Jeff. You have a very interesting perspective on this as a front row observer of culture. Please talk to me about how you are navigating in this moment and what do you want to say? Thanks, Monique. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge and uh, thank for advertising week for putting us on. Um, I have a I have an interesting um, viewpoint on it, coming from the entertainment business. Hollywood was built on a racist system and a racist structure. So, we think about the history of Hollywood. If we look at movies, the way that we've been as Black people been depicted. Um, negative stereotypes have, have shaped America's view and actually the world view of us as a people. We're still fighting those stereotypes that constantly are depicted in these images that we see in the media. So if you think about it, like a couple of days ago, HBO Max took Gone with the Wind off the air because they said they, the reason, the rationale was because of the negative depictions that were in that movie. But the next day, Gone with the Wind becomes the number one 
movie on Amazon. So what does that say for America or the world? It's like, hey, HBO Max did the right thing and took and made the right step, but the hunger for that media is there because people just went to another platform to find the movie. So I, I find that really interesting that, that the movie jumped to number one. Um, so we have a lot of work to do, but the problem is that is the systemic racism that is prevalent in the entertainment industry with the studios and the networks is that where the studios would rather pay for the content because it generates revenue for the company, but they're not willing to share the power in the boardroom. So where there's a, there's a huge imbalance of black executives at the studios that are making decisions, black executives in the networks are making decisions, but we see a constant stream of um, PR and marketing about the advances that we make. And we have made advances in front of the screen. So we're seeing more directors. We're seeing more female producers and directors. We're seeing more actors. We're actually seeing more movies being made. But the people inside the studios that are actually controlling and making decisions and, and, and handling the marketing movies, we're not represented. So, it did, so the problem on an entertainment city, it's, it's just the, the power, the sharing of power. The, we don't control anything. We don't control distribution. We don't control the marketing. We're not making the decisions. But yet, the insensitive, insensitivity that a lot of the, um, I think that the executives have in the studios, they don't understand the culture, so there's nobody inside. So what, what do they do? They go hire a, a VP of diversity token person in the studio, as you know, you got a VP of diversity who can't really make a lot of change. A lot of times the VP of diversity is not sitting in the room when a lot of the decisions are made. So from my standpoint, there has to be a change in the power or we have to work together to empower ourselves. As a people, if we did come together, we do have the ability to make change with um, within the Hollywood structure, but we have to work as a unit, work as a goal. We have to speak up and now is the time. I mean, I'm really encouraged by um, black, brown, white coming together out and vocalizing what's going on, but we have to keep that going, keep the moment going. It can't be, it can't be a hashtag social media promotion and then a month later, there's another news cycle and we forget about it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jeff. You know, one of a good friend of mine, you know, we've talked about the fact that allyship is a verb mm -hmm. and that um, it is active and we need to make sure that this is an actionable change to really get at the systemic racism that is uh, appearing in all of our industries. Um, with that, uh, Gianta, I want to go to you. And, you know, I was so fascinated when I, you know, heard your name. Um, and that meaning rise above. And I would absolutely love to see how you are navigating and feeling in this moment and what are some of the things you'd like to open to the group? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, you know, I've been working in advertising for over 15 years and looking at what we're going through and the opportunities that I've had to create messages that, that basically, um, you know, demonstrate our similarities uh, has been the predominant thing that I've always pushed as I've worked in various brands like Nike, Twitter. Um, and I think what we're going through right now, and I agree with what everything what everyone is saying right now, um, you know, what, you know, my group uh, co-founders at Saturday Morning have been able to do with people like Mark Pritchard at PNG to create messages alongside some of the things that are happening in culture to galvanize, to help us see ourselves as um, not other, I think has, it's just been, it's been amazing. And so I agree with Jeff in terms of just the power structure within leadership, within these brands, studios, to continue to give us the opportunity to uh, create authenticity, you know, and, and not tokenship. And, um, you know, the, the thing that I'm, I have a two-year-old son and I'm sure a lot of us on this uh, have children as well. And I, I think, because he, he's blissfully unaware right now what's going on around him, he's loved. But, you know, in five to 10 years when things, when the awareness builds, um, you know, I, I, it is my hope that what we've been doing, what's happening now will 
create the type of sustained change that gives us all the opportunities to see that this is not just a moment in time, um, but it is an actual redefining of time, you know, for everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is, this is that moment and it's the moment that we will make of it. And it is gonna be about sustainable and continuous change so that we can see the other side. Last but not least, I'd love to talk to you, Tip. You wrote a song, you were inspired by this moment. You guys all heard that song um, as we were coming into the session and it's called They Don't. And I'd love, Tip, for you to tell a little bit about what the inspiration was, how you're feeling in this moment and ultimately your unique perspective on uh, the criminal justice system. Well, okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you uh, all of the panelists, man, who uh, share, who sharing the the screen with me. Uh, I think, man, for the most part, I want to be positive about the things that we do have right now, because you know, a lot of us, myself included, spend so much time focusing on the deficit, you know, the things that we don't have, the reasons why we haven't made it uh, farther. Uh, but I, I would like to just take a take an opportunity to applaud some of the things that we do have. You know, um, I, I think we have a, a generation now that has become uh, action based and revolutionary uh, by way of disruption and resistance to to the systems of oppression that we have experienced uh, for. 400 plus years. I think that is a necessary tool. That is, I think that's a key factor. Um, I've seen these kids, man, kind of, I mean, kids, my, my son's age, uh, take their own initiative, their own drive and, and galvanize themselves and the people around them, uh, to, to basically show that this is, you know, the time is up. And I, just speaking a little bit to the points made before by uh, Jeff um, and and Jantea about uh, the 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 balance of power, especially in Hollywood and entertainment. Uh, one thing I think we got to we got to understand this man: oppressors don't share power. You know what I'm saying? Leverage is what will distribute that power uh, uh, adequately. So I think we have to continue to tell our own stories, speak to our own people, um, remind ourselves that culture is our commodity. Uh, I think that the the our consumer base, uh, whether you say black people, hip hop, right, people of color, minorities, our consumer base is enough to turn any tide in 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 any in any uh uh how can i say uh profit based society okay if you have a profit based society that means they need they need the consumer base of us which is 1.3 trillion annually and they need that in order to meet in order to reach reach their quotas and um and continue to have their quarterly bonuses. Uh, I think that's a big thing that I feel we all, as a as a people, that that's an action that we can take immediately. And I feel, and we spoke a little bit. I heard um, uh, Mayor Mayor Keisha Lance Bottom speak about uh, apartheid in South Africa, and you know the way young people said we're not flying delta we're not drinking coca-cola as long as you support this we're not supporting you and you know that was you know uh, one domino among many that led to you know inevitably you know the you know the 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 re reconstructing of of laws and policies in south africa so i think that if we could kind of galvanize ourselves our efforts around attacking the financial base of what we consider this this power of oppression uh, i think that's our strongest tool continuing to and right now this is a powerful moment 
Uh, this is a powerful moment. I think that we, we've never seen anything like this. You know, we've never seen anything like this where so many people were engaged, so many people were in unison, so many people were sticking together uh, all for a common goal. And, and, and we do ourselves and uh, the next generation a terrible disservice if we didn't wrap our arms around uh, the, the, the youth and allow them to make mistakes, but guide and direct as much as possible. Uh, there is no perfect revolution. You know what I'm saying? They're, like It ain't going to look the way we've imagined it in our heads necessarily. <laughs> it may come, it may take different shape, different form. Uh, but this is a very multifaceted, diverse list of, of problems that we have. So we must we must answer, we must answer it with diverse, multifaceted uh, solutions. And as long as we continue to, to remain solution based, uh, stay focused on the things that we have collectively, and talents we have individually of, uh, as far as how to aid, assist, and contribute wherever, wherever possible. Uh, I think that change is inevitable. Absolutely. But Thank what you. a time to be alive. What a time, what a time. So with that, I'd like to stay with that theme of we're in these uncharted waters and we have to move to action. And in Daba, you know, your, your legacy, your family, you, are just in the center of what you saw as something that was revolutionary, a real change in how people could see a future and how young people can affect change. I'd love for you and Mark to talk a little bit about why in this moment, the global revolution, the global effect that this is having, having and how do we unearth that how do we continue to make it actionable and keep it sustainable, right? We, I know we all have that moment of this could be a new cycle away from you know, disappearance. How do we make sure that this stays on the front page of everybody's mind? And Daba, I'd love for you to start and Mark, you can please follow up quickly. Yes, um, you know, I think people around the world have realized that injustice to black and brown people, you know, is not something that is only for black and brown people uh, to, to remedy. It's for everybody to, to get involved because it's about bridging the gap and creating some sort of equitable change um, and, and trying to balance the, the equation of society that has purposefully been set this way. So when you see people in Canada, in, in, in Spain, um, and many other parts of the world protesting, taking their time to go out and actually disobey COVID, it shows you that injustice has become a much higher priority than COVID, right? We are willing to get sick just so we can protest and stand next to our brothers and sisters in solidarity so that the system can no longer ignore us. So for me, you know, what my brother Tip is talking about when, you know, the real way is to be able to hurt them is through the purse in the pocket. Now you talk about the America buying power of $1.3 trillion. Now imagine we had created a global African fund, right? Where every person of African origin contributes to that fund on an annual basis. Now you take the American $1.3 dollars and you put Nigeria on top of that. You put Angola on top of that. You put Ethiopia on top of that, right? You put all these powerful African nations and wealth together, you're going to have probably 10 times more. So now you are now actually at a global position of power where China, Russia, America, and Europe cannot ignore you anymore because you have managed to mobilize the resources of the whole African nation. And for me, we need to consistently communicate with young people and give them ways and show them why it is important 
why we should put our money together and invest it where we would like and where our interests lie. That's why that, that suggestion by Brother Tip is so valuable. And I think we can all contribute to creating something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? I think you're on mute, Mark. I said, yeah, thank you very much. I think your question focused on how to sustain uh, where we are and how to sustain the movement. And I think uh, TI's suggestion about the economic infrastructure that we do have, uh, focusing on the assets that we do have and how we can deploy and build and leverage those assets is a very important element of how you build a sustainable movement. Uh, and one thing we do at our work is we try to help people understand and educate people on disparities. And so economic disparities are broad and deep in America. Uh, black peoples uh, on, our, on, our, on our economic index have 55% of what whites have when you look at a combination of jobs, income, wealth, uh, investments. And, and that's, you know, think about it. We were three-fifths of a person in the original United States Constitution. And we're 55% of where white Americans are in terms of our economics. So we've got to educate people at these disparities. Uh, and our, our own community needs to be conversant on the figure of 1.345 trillion in spending power, on the wealth gap being 10 to one, on the income gap being an average median income for a black family, 40 for a white family, 70. Thousand. We need to be conversant on that to be able to push the arguments. But it, what I'm focused on uh, is, is public policy changes in the immediate. That's why this policing bill uh, is an important step that can be taken. That's why all these efforts, whether it's in Los Angeles or New York or Minneapolis, uh, at the local level, Washington, D.C. took steps uh, recently at the city council level to change policing, to reform policing, to refocus investments and assets and dollars on programs that help people, more social workers, more psychologists, more investment in youth, uh, more investment in the things we need in affordable housing. Uh, we've got to push uh, the changes we need on multiple fronts. And I think in order to do that, we've got to keep the activism alive. So on August 28th, uh, there's going to be a commemorative protest slash march in Washington being organized uh, by Reverend Al Sharpton and the National Urban League will be joining in and supporting that effort, which is another effort to bring literally millions of people together for this cause uh, for racial justice, this cause against police brutality. Uh, so we've got to ma maintain, I think the activism is important. And we also have to, and, and Mayor Bottoms talked about this, we've got to have voting on the agenda protecting the vote, protecting the vote, using the vote and leveraging our political power to get the kind of commitments and the type of action that we need to address the period of time where we are. So we've got a lot to do. We've got to maintain the activism. We've also got to use this time to educate ourselves and educate this nation about the way in which race has played out. You know, I, I, as, as, as uh, Ndaba was speaking, I thought about the fact that the, the narrative of global history for the last 500 years has been slavery and colonialism. Uh, and even Pope Leo, I believe, the Catholic pontiff in the 15 or 1400s, sanctioned uh, the Portuguese uh, to begin and to begin the system of capturing Africans and bringing them to first South America and later to the Caribbean and North America how this system of slavery and colonialism was the defining movement, the defining narrative uh, of, of, of the globe uh, for the last 500 years and how we've been in this time now with the modern civil rights movement, with the freedom movements all across the African continent, with the anti-apartheid movement, we've been 
now for 50, 60, 70 years, pushing hard to dismantle the remnants, the remnants of colonialism and the global slave trade. And what that should tell us is that this fight isn't a one week, two week, three month, six month, one year, two year, three year. This is an effort to really change direction on a permanent and long lasting basis. And that's gonna be the challenge for our generation, uh, for, for the young activists. And my, you know, my view is you need the energy of the young, you need the wisdom of the elders. We have to have a movement that spans multiple generations. Uh, and, and this is a time, but the historical narrative, see in, in the United States, it's just, it's not taught. American history books almost all need to be thrown out uh, and rewritten. So people won't get this sort of, I call it the Pax Americana, manifest destiny in our narrative that you get around American history, that uh, you know America uh, and Europeans uh, colonized and did slavery to Christianize and, and to make civilized uh, the heathenist people of the world. You know, the narrative of white supremacy uh, and domination that was built in, it was built into religion, it was built into history books. So it was injected into the veins and the DNA, generations, generations of folks. So we're trying to begin the process of undoing that. And, 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 and it's gonna be a lot of work and it's gonna be tough and it's gonna be hard. But the real question that's always on the, on the table for me, is this a moment or is this a movement? This is a movement. And as long as everyone on this call is committed, I believe this is a movement. One of the things that we talk about all the time is the fact that over the next 30 years, 90% of the growth in the US is going to come from three groups, Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians. So how can we ignore them as a group? How do we not concentrate on these growth markets? So to your point, from an economic standpoint, from a political standpoint, from a social and safety and educational, we've got so many areas that we need to affect as we become the true majority within this country and certainly around the world. We're really talking about the browning of the world. So with that, Jeff and Gianta would love to kind of understand what are your thoughts around what the change agenda looks like. You're firmly in spaces that are forward facing to the world and tip as well. You see the world, you understand content, you understand how people are engaging and what's moving them. How do we put this change agenda out there? How do we do it in a way that's going to be effective and long-term? Jeff or Deonta? So I think, you know, one of the immediate things because it, and i and i love this panel because it's, it's we're talking about action and i think that we you know the people who have spoken around the world and definitely have to move to actionable items um so one of the things the immediate responses from all of the entertainment companies and music companies and the film studios was to put out a statement and then make a donation you can go down the line everybody made a donation now the interesting thing about it is that the where those donations went were very consistent across all of the companies. You know, they, they went to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the Equal Justice Initiative, Amnesty International, National Bailout, the Bailout Project. From my perspective, if we're talking about putting money towards the bailout, we we've actually missed the mark because that means one of our people have been arrested and are in the court system. We have to get in front of them getting into the court system. And I and I, I, I totally believe that um, education opportunity is the way. Now, the United States has the number one incarceration world rate in the world, the number one incarceration rate in the world. We've heard the stats, um, black men are jailed five to one to white men. So we have, we have black men getting jailed at a high alarming rate. And we have, if you look at the graduation rates and you look at what's happening with the HBCUs, we, those are going the other way while the prison system is going up. So when we talk about 
police brutality, police brutality is just, that's just a spoke or a cog in the wheel, is that you have to look at, one is the prison system, the prison, for, prison for, um, profit system, is that it's a $5 billion a year industry. What if that $5 billion a year was going towards education and health to change the conditions and give people the opportunity um, to get an education? We think about, if we look at COVID right now, right? So now we have distance learning and you've got 34, 34% of black Americans don't have internet. 42% don't have personal computers. So how are they learning? So how are they able to continue school? So like right now, we're seeing a curve right now that's, that's spiked by COVID is that you guys students are have even having an issue trying to finish their semester out because they don't have computers or they don't have internet. But yet you've got billions of dollars being generated by the prison profit system. I mean, and that profit and that, that prison profit industry trickles down to the police department, it trickles down to the justice, it trickles down to the courts. We have to address it from the top. So from my standpoint, you know, um, my thing is right now, like I'm getting a group together. I want to have a dialogue with the students in the entertainment industry. Like I applaud you for donating this money over here. That's great. But let's make sure money is going to places that can help to turn the tide on what is going on. Because like I said, once you get to court, that means that person's already been arrested, has already had an encounter with a police officer good or bad, but he's already been arrested. He's in the system and now he's trying to bail himself out. We need to get in front of that as, as media and companies. And then the other thing I look at just, um, and I know I'm going a little bit away from the entertainment stuff, but these are, these are things that are prevalent. So the number one employer, private employer for black Americans in the United States is Walmart. They are the number one employer. They employ the most people. Um, their employers are called associates. Most of the people that are employed by Walmart qualify for food stamps. So that means they can barely survive. That's a fact. <laughs> you, can, you know, you can, look, you can look it up. So, and you know how much as a people, we frequently go to Walmart, which is why they have to have those employees. Today. So it's, it's basically, it's, it, for me, it's, it's, some, it's similar to what the, what's happening in the entertainment scene. Those employees at Walmart are window dressing. You're paying them minimum wage. They're barely getting by. Half of them are only on part-time. But you have to have those employees there at the counter because you know that we as a people shop there. So there's there's things, as you as you know, there's things that we can do um, that are actual items to initiate change. And, and from the studio side, from the studio side, and you know, in addition to where they're donating money, it's because they don't have anybody inside to help them because because, because of there's none of us inside. So they, they, they believe they're doing the right thing, but that's just because they don't have anybody inside to do the right thing. They're going to have to um, hire black executives. They're going to have to put they people have, on the board gonna have to who have, have a voice. Really that, that like, to me, that's the first thing. If you, if you're putting out content, um, you're benefiting off the culture, but you don't have anybody inside in the boardroom. You don't have any inside work, and that that's just not going to work. That's that has to change. But oftentimes, what you hear is, "Well, we can't find anybody that's qualified," which is a, which is a bunch of BS. So one of the things we're doing, like there's there's actually somebody, uh, one of the executives put a thread on LinkedIn, is we're putting together this board of qualified black executives who can work inside students. I think it's I think they're even talking about the advertising industry, because one of the things you always hear, like I said, is. Uh, with, there's not enough executives available. We can't find, but well, let's let hear some executives that qualify. Also, with this, for me, with the studios, is you need to start recruiting from the HBCUs. You need to create internship programs. You have to give people opportunities. They're not making the effort. So, what I don't want this to be is a moment, a, a moment, a hashtag moment, social media moment with the studios where they donate some money, they said, and then they go back to business. This has to be an ongoing move. Absolutely. No, the DNI efforts absolutely need teeth and they need to be measured. So we only really treasure what we measure. I know we're running, um, we're running a little tight, so we want to make sure we get everybody in here. So Gianta, can you talk a little bit about brands and how, you know, brands are used, used as exchange agents? What are we going to do as an advertising industry um, to figure out how we start holding folks more accountable in terms of where they put their dollars, how um, they show up and engagement overall. 
Yeah, thank you. This this discussion is it's, it's very inspiring, and I'm and taking pieces of this for your question, and I'm going to try to synthesize all of this because one of the main reasons Saturday morning came together was because of the killings that were happening four years ago, and you know Keith Cartwright, Jeff Edwards, Deja Cox, and Kwame Harper Taylor, and I all got together and said we all work in these industries, CAA, advertising agencies, and brands that absolutely we have used our talents to help them make lots of money and to create messages that sort of get people to buy things or like them. Um, could we use that same power, that same intellectual sort of property to promote peace? And, and that's really what, how we form Saturday morning. And we're able to do the things that we're doing with um, you know, brands like Procter & Gamble. You know, it's, it's <laughs> brands, are at the center of this discussion as much as politics and all the other things that we're seeing. Uh, brands are global, so they're multinational. Um, and what I'm seeing, what we're all seeing around the world with people coming together to sort of galvanize this movement, um, you know, is not as represented as we're all seeing within the boardrooms of, of brands and advertising agencies. But, you know, moving forward, I think people like myself uh, being given the opportunities to structure organizations around inclusive mindsets and seeking our similarities in a way that builds more compassion and more understanding. So the messages that get into the world actually resonate and vibrate at a higher level, a higher frequency, and resonate to sustain all the things we're talking about, about momentum and sustained build of this whole sort of uh, mindset that we're now finally, as a global society, um, taking on. And it's I mean, gosh, like I was looking on my uh, feed the other day, the Confederate flag being banned um, at NASCAR, you know, the, the general that was hired in the Air Force, like you're seeing some things that are the right signals, you know, and, and, and I don't know if you all watched the, the general's um, sort of uh, speech about his getting the role, but it, it just, it, it really impresses upon me and my role and my foundation with, with uh, my partners at Saturday morning and the brands that we get to interact with collectively and individually that we need to continue to work on the inside, not just as change agents, because that's, that's what we, that's low hanging fruit, right? But to really create understanding in the boardroom that as I've been saying to my partners, we open the door and create a line of sight. You don't open the door, then it shuts behind us. You create line of sight, so you're helping people who are in mid-level, junior level, in colleges and in, in elementary schools understand the power of the mind and the ability to shape conversations that really empower us as you know as a society. But it, it's it's a really great question, um, and again, all of you have been you're really inspiring me to further think about how I want to you know push my own um, beliefs forward uh, with the things I get to do, but thank you. Monique, uh, yeah, may I, I, I'm gonna have to excuse myself uh, for another commitment. No problem. Thank you so and, much, Mark. Uh, let me just Could thank you just everybody. Leave us with one, I just want a lightning round from you, just one word that you want everyone to leave this town hall with. Aluta continua. Aluta continua. continua. Awesome, the amen. Continues. Thank you. Black Lives Matter. Matter. Keep up the work. Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Tip, in the last moments, I would love for you to talk to us a little bit about what we should be doing as we look forward to this election. Politics are inextricably linked to everything that's going on right now. What do you want to tell the world around? What should we be doing? What kind of energy should we be putting forward to make sure that this change agenda moves through? Um, <clears throat> Let me see, there are a few things, but first, if I could just say, because, you know, especially to uh, our friends and, and, and family and constituents that work within the, the, the advertising agency, um, I need y'all to help me with something, because I am so sick and tired of watching white people make unauthorized, inaccurate, unwarranted, offensive decisions on our behalf to market products to our culture without any consideration 
uh, of of our heritage as though, you know what I'm saying? It just, yeah, 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 just do that. They'll, 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 they'll take it. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like back in the early 90s, man, when they was, you know, they they, they felt uh, hip hop, uh, uh, a hip hop, uh, a generic hip hop break beat in a McDonald's commercial. It's going to make, forgive my term, it's going to make niggas eat more hamburgers. So that, like that kind of thinking, you see what I'm saying? That is what I feel we all collectively and individually have to fight. Um, and and but I feel like we have all the tools necessary. You know what I'm saying? Because God gonna only fight on one side. And you know, and, and I, I I feel we all know what side that is. So all we got to do is show up, be be uh, intentional. Uh, and, and, and not waver and not, and have, have more faith than fear because fear and faith can't exist in the same place. Uh, right. and also I think we got to be considerate, uh, and, and empathetic almost to our enemy because Man, just to be honest with you, man, white supremacy, the reason they fight so hard for it is because the shit, that's all they got left. Ain't really got shit else. They ain't really got shit else. So a person with nothing to lose is the most diabolical adversary you will ever find. Um, but what they don't understand is that, you know, white supremacy is really, it, it's a a tic-tac of a meal that is, is, is placed there to divide, create a diversion. So they could continue to uh, marginalize us and our communities. But what, what's not being recognized is as soon as they finish with us, they going straight to the poor white people. So we have the same enemy. Uh, uh, ultimately, we all just have to continue to fight on the side of right. Uh, I heard there was a lot, there, there was some conversation about privatized prison industries. I mean, I feel like this entire justice system has been set up since 1865 to reinstill slavery. And now we have uh, more, more, more black men as inmates than we had as slaves. And that, you know, to me is, is like, you know, just a, a dastardly plan that has worked all too well. Um, but the, but the good news is we have the tools to reverse it. We have the tools, as long as we continue to remind ourselves, our children, our neighbors, our brothers, our friends, that culture is our commodity. When when we were stripped from, from our native land and stripped from our, our native tongue and our, all of our traditions and uh, religions, we were, as a people, kind of lost and had no way to identify with the rest of the world. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like through hip-hop, and you know the uh, uh, other movements like the civil rights movement, Nation of Islam, um, HBCU, so many, you know, other other uh, movements across the diaspora. Uh, we have created our own culture, our own story, and I think that has empowered us. That has empowered us beyond belief. Uh, because before we, like, I, I know for a long time, I thought, you know, kind of like black people started with slavery. I thought that, you know what I'm saying, that's what we were. Until I began to read and, you know, just kind of educate myself. And speaking of education, another thing I feel we have to stop doing. We have to stop allowing our oppressors to educate our children. Um, and we spoke about, you know, the textbooks in, in, in middle schools and high schools and how they need to be basically, you know, disbanded, you know what I'm saying, and abolished because it's, 
it's it's a it's a, a very dangerous yes, rhetoric. Can. You dig what I'm saying? Like I give you an example. You will never see uh Jewish kids being educated in a school by a curriculum that celebrates Hitler as a hero. It'll never happen. You know what I'm saying? And it shouldn't ever happen. However, when I know I had a class in eighth grade uh, called Georgia History or something like that, and all they talked about was Nathan Bedford and Robert E. Lee and all these, you know, old racist Confederate losers of war. And I don't know anywhere else where you celebrate losers. I mean, people who fought a war and lost and they still have monuments. Who else, who else does that? You know what I'm saying? So I think, you know, a big part of our, a big part of our, our disparity is education, opportunities, and exposure. Uh, and before, you know, a lot of times we could use that as an excuse, but now it's enough of us in enough powerful positions with enough relationships and enough resources to stand in the gap and fill the void. Uh, and so I think that with that being said, the time is now. We definitely have to um, use the, the, the voting process to our advantage and i know that there were conversations about you know the 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 false narratives of voting doesn't work and you know it doesn't make a difference well I, i'll just you know just as a strategic thinker most times i will say if voting didn't matter they wouldn't be working so hard to keep us from doing it that's right. You know what I'm saying? That's there are there are there are systemic policies and procedures in place that you know continuously divert our efforts or or try to distract us or try to intimidate us or you know what I'm saying? Well, we 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 will take our eyes off of the prize of you know electing officials that represent our causes and concerns. Um, but also, with, 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 in addition to that, we also have to, as a consumer base, remain aligned, remain steadfast, diligent, uh, and purposeful with where we spend our dollar, who we spend it with. And, and the main thing I think we could do to help ourselves in the struggle is not take our foot off date whatever respective body parts you would like to use. Uh, because, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, this is a moment and every moment has a window, you know what I'm saying? So right now, everything that comes up is being addressed immediately, whether it's a Confederate monument or whether it's a, a company that was insensitive or the remarks of, you know, someone calling the police for for, B, for for BS. Either way it goes, you have a moment right now. So what we could do is continue to shed light on oppression, uh, it from from no no matter how major or minute. Uh, textbooks are big things. The stories and the rhetoric that they're continuing to perpetuate throughout the curriculum of our children only leads to. Uh, a less of a sense of self. You know, Absolutely. anything you build up on lies is gonna have a weak foundation and it won't stand strong. So I think yeah. that, you know, we have those things, other monuments that that should not be celebrated, that we wouldn't want our children to, you know, have to 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 go and behold and be reminded of such a a poor part of history. So if everybody does a little, no one has to do a lot. I, That's I right. You guys oh, for, perfect. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Gianta, I would love uh, your parting words. Yes. We got to wrap this up. I know we're over time. So, thank you, Advertising Week, for giving us a, a few more moments to make sure that all these brothers get to get their voices heard. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm, I thank you for uh, coming to me because I wanted to follow up quickly on something T.I. said. And T.I., like, again, very inspiring and I think you said something that touched me um, and probably a lot of people are watching right now is 
you know, making sure that there are people within these brands that represent our culture authentically in the way you do with your music. I'm a big Prince fan, the way that he did with his music and advocating for, you know, artist rights. If you don't own your masters, your masters own you. Um, I think one of the small aspects of, of this conversation that maybe is implicit, but I just want to overstate it is we're talking about brands, but we also need to talk about tech. And when I say tech, I mean, Apple, Google, Facebook, um, you know, all of these massive platforms that have become so important as we've been galvanizing things that have been happening around the world and the accountability, or maybe the first word is responsibility of these platforms and people like us that connect with others around the world to, um, you know, again, galvanize the movement. So again, um, thank you so much for having me on behalf of Saturday Morning. Um, as I look forward, I am, I'm very inspired by these conversations. I'm inspired by what's happening in the world right now. And, you know, Saturday morning's ability to continue to connect with brands and, and CMOs and leaders on all fronts to help, you know, embolden change um, in this country. And I'm also very hopeful um, about the things that we're beginning to see within brands and with agencies in terms of really um, having leadership that looks like the world around us and, and representing content, context, and conversations that um, bring us together and don't separate us. Um, again, thank you so much for having me as part of this panel. Absolutely, thank you, Gianta. Jeff, I'd like to go to you. What, what do you wanna leave the audience with? Basically, what I'd like to leave the audience with is, um, I'm very focused on education. It's like we have to. I mean, this this is a great group, and we all have um, people in our and in each individual network that we continue to push for education. But we also, I, I we have to hold companies accountable. When I say accountable, it's not this is not an affirmative action moment. This is about accountability to the culture, to America. Um, we have an obligation to hold companies like. Allstate, Merrill Lynch, and American Express, who actually have contributed and invested in the prison system. Let's divert some of that funds to HBCUs. Let's focus on education. Let's focus on all of us um, on here, either control or part of um, companies. Let's make sure that we're providing internship opportunities. Let's make sure we can provide jobs and provide that light because a lot of kids, a lot of people don't know that well, what can I do in the advertising industry or what kind of jobs are in the music side? What kind of jobs are in the flip side? A lot of, a lot of kids don't know. So we have to continue to educate. Um, and then one thing I think you just said too, because I've been talking about entertainment, but I think when you start talking about the tech companies, the, the Facebooks and the Instagrams and Twitter, stuff like that, it's, it's even worse. And when you talk about how we're represented there, um, that's another thing that has to be addressed because as you know, we're all the biggest users of social media, but the representation inside is, is when you walk in there, you can, you can count it on, a, in one, on one hand. So I think we have to keep pushing the agenda because we are, to go into what Tip said, we are probably the biggest consumers of social media, of, of packaged goods, of, of, of we're the recipients of that. And we do have, a, as a people, we do have the power, um, to leverage our power to make change. Absolutely, thank you. And Daba, I'd love to close with you. What would be your parting words and how do we keep this going? I think you're on mute. Okay, sorry guys. Um, I think this has provided a great opportunity for the unification and for the connection of not only people of African origin around the world, but people who believe in justice. Um, as we know, education is the most important tool to change the world. And so when you look at, you know, what has Tip just mentioned right now is that how can we continue to allow these masters to educate our children? It is important that parents are involved in making sure they are looking at the curriculum that their kids are being taught at schools. 
it's not enough for you to just leave it to the schools to educate your child. You as parents, as guardians need to be very much involved in that process. It is time that the people of America who believe in justice and wanna get rid of the ugly face of prejudice to continue the pressure that has been mounted on the system so that we can get reform of the justice system immediately from the jails to the courts, to the laws themselves and the police conduct. All these things that fall under the justice system need reform, not today, but yesterday. And so, you know, we want to uh, reassure the people of America who believe in justice that they have support and have seen it um, like never before. It's an unprecedented time. And so let us continue marching on, uniting, and I believe as long as the people of the world who believe in justice continue to communicate, to embrace, to connect and ultimately unite, there is nothing that will stop us from achieving a more fair and just world. Thank you so much. I so appreciate your words. I so appreciate you, T.I. I so appreciate you, Jeff. So appreciate you, Gianta. Thank you to Advertising Week. Thank you to the Mandela Institute of Humanity. And thank you to the National Urban League. We really are in a changed moment. We can chart the path to the future. We can make this better. We can keep this on the front page if we so choose. One more time. Absolutely. T.I., I understand you have one more thing you'd like to put into the world before we leave? I, no, I, I, I can definitely say something if you want me to, but I, it wasn't <laughs> upon my request. I just got a note in my ear, so I just wanted to make sure I didn't. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to make sure I, I thank you all for the opportunity to speak yet again, and thank you for sharing the, sharing the screen with me. Uh, I guess, man, if there's one thing I can say in closing is the time is now and the power is ours. So whatever we do with it, you know, that will be to our benefit or detriment. Well, I will let you, that will be our close. Thank you everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being a part of this wonderful town hall for change. Have a great day, everyone. Right on, likewise. Take care everyone. Thank you.